I wish I knew then what I know now. See, when we learned that Gary Bohannon was going to South Florida, we didn't know why or, or what was going on. And in hindsight, there's a lot more to that move than we understood then. And we're starting to slowly understand it now. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Drake Toll here with Sikkim 365, talking all things Gary Bohanna today, joined by Robert Stieg. Rob is with Stampede Sport. What is it, the Daily Stampede? That's like an everyday, yep. like that sounds just really aggressive, but I see like the bull pun there, so I appreciate that. We're both thanking you for making Locked On Baylor your first listen every single day. And Stieg, Gary Bohanna is not going to Oklahoma. He is not going to Missouri or Iowa State or Minnesota. He's going to South Florida. And if anybody knows why, it's probably Gary Bohannon. But also, our guy Stieg, uh, unfold this for us. It, it's, it came as a, uh, as a surprise, I think, uh, not to you know, go into the full timeline of Gary Bohannon's recruitment to USF. Or it wasn't even really a recruitment at that point. Um, you know, it, we, I woke up one day and I got a little you know, twick in my ear. And I heard that Gary was taking a visit to USF after he visited Missouri. And I was like, Hey, maybe wants a little vacation out of it. Maybe wants to enjoy the weather for a little bit. Um, but then it started to pick up steam a little bit more than, than I had normally thought. Uh, I, I contacted my guy that covers Mizzou and he was like, yeah, Gary's basically a lock here. You know, had a great visit, went to a softball game, loved every second of it. And then uh, 48 hours later, you know, we get the Gary Bohannon commitment graphic and spread like wildfire ESPN articles. I think it was the most uh, positive thing that's been talked about USF in the last probably four years. So uh, it, it was nice to get USF in the positive news cycle for once. Um, yes, but see, watch out with the weather stuff, by the way. You go too deep <laughs> on the weather in Tampa. Folks don't like that. They don't like that. But keep going. Sorry to cut you off. No, you're a hey, we have beautiful weather. He he visited on literally probably the last perfectly good weekend that we've had recently down here. It's rainy season now. So but yeah, it, it, it came as a surprise. And, you know, for me, at least I'm very tuned into how the recruiting process is working and, and you know, what these coaches are tuned into and. I was just as surprised as I think probably most of the country was because it didn't seem like it was uh, the right fit. I think everyone in the country and unabashedly, I say Mizzou was probably the better fit. They don't have an experienced quarterback uh, leaving that locker room there. Their Eli is, is needing a, a, an experienced quarterback. He found one that's been in college for 17 years, but you know, it, it definitely came as a surprise, but for, for us, at least, you know, I, I think all USF fans were extremely thrilled that Gary Bohannon chose somehow called up Jeff Scott and said, Hey, I want to come in for a visit, which I very rarely hear that players initiate this visit, fell in love with it. They talked with our, uh, the new offensive coordinator that USF has, uh, Travis Trickett, brother of uh, Clint Trickett and the Trickett disciples. So they talked, apparently hit it off, explained uh, the direction of the program that they're trying to do. And, and they said, hey, Gary, we want you to be the one that kickstarts this program back up into high gear. And I guess that's all you really need to say. It's like speed dating at that point. You know, one of the things, Stieg, that I got in trouble for on our show about uh, two weeks ago when Gary Bohannon first announced was my immediate shock. Like, obviously, we didn't have all the, the information points or he have, we hadn't heard Gary at that point talk about why USF. But from your standpoint, obviously, then we were much more confused as to why than we are now. From your standpoint, why USF over at, at, in Oklahoma or in Missouri? What about this program has that draw for a guy like Gary Bohannon? Right. I think it comes down to two main things. And I, the first one is going to be, like I mentioned, new offensive coordinator, Travis Trickett. The quarterback room that USF has currently, you know, Sands Bohannon, it's a very young, inexperienced locker room for, for the quarterbacks. Uh, obviously, Tim McLean, uh, the incumbent starter from last year, he, he's fantastic. He, we loved him. He, he has a lot of intangibles that you really want in a quarterback. Could Travis Marsh, uh, the second string quarterback last year, he has a cannon for an arm, just can absolutely let one loose. And if you go look through USF's highlights from their practices, nine times out of 10, if it's a deep ball strike, it's Gary Bohannon, or not, excuse me, it's Travis Marsh throwing, throwing a deep ball about 60 yards. 
And then the only other two quarterbacks we have in that locker room are two incoming freshmen. Um, so really it's two so or it's a redshirt sophomore, a true sophomore, and then two true freshmen in that locker room. And when we were looking at this uh, during the, you know, the heyday of the transfer portal a couple months ago, I kind of said, I was like, hey, it might not be a bad idea to get a guy in a grad transfer who can come in maybe one season, maybe two seasons, depending on how it goes, kind of lead the team where it needs to be, maybe, you know, mentor these younger quarterbacks a little bit, knowing that, you know, the time is limited, and then go to the NFL, finish out your career somewhere, you know, and making money and kind of say, hey, how you doing and get out of there. You know, if you really want to roll the dice with Timmy starting again next year, you could do that. You probably won't rattle him too much, but I think it was the perfect merging of worlds for Gary with the new offensive coordinator we have, the the position that he'd come into. I don't want to say he's the solidified starter because Jeff Scott is not that kind of guy where he wants that to happen, but he was very upfront with Katravis and Timmy before Gary had taken that visit and said, hey, this is a competition. You got to earn your spot every single time. Every football coach is going to say that. And you got to earn your spot. And Gary's going to come in. He's going to come in for a visit. You know, we still believe in you guys being able to lead our team, but we got to put the best person in that position since it is such a crucial position. You know, it's not like bringing in a running back where you can kind of do a running back by committee. One quarterback usually starts the entire year and then you can get a, you know, a few uh, chunk plays at the end with a, with a freshman or uh, a sophomore out of that. Mm -hmm. So I think it just the, the fit that they were looking for, I think, try, uh, uh, excuse me, I think with our new offense coordinator, I, I think he was looking for a quarterback that had a, a dynamic deep ball opportunity with just some good legs on him as well. Timmy, great legs on him, willing to take off and run. Trey Marsh, deep ball, and you kind of mix those two together and boom, here we have Gary Bohannon. Steeg, I, I mentioned on the show, let me give myself credit here from all the USF fans that I made very, very angry two weeks ago. I did mention how Jeff Scott has worked with Taj Boyd, Deshaun Watson. Like, look at his resume of quarterbacks. Pretty darn good stuff. So when Gary Bohannon sees that, that's a selling point. But 3-18 and 18 on the other side of that, right? As a head coach now in two seasons at USF, two of the worst seasons to start at a program in college football history, might I say. But looking at, at Jeff Scott, how big is he as a selling point for a quarterback out there? He is an an okay selling point. He's he's not a. I think you can categorize uh, some coaches into three categories. You know, they're they're kind of there as a head coach, and and you know they they call the plays and they're the front and everything like that. Then you have your quarterback guru type of type of head coaches out there, the ones that you kind of uh, can foster a quarterback and really get things going. Uh, you know, the the Nick Sabans of the world. You know, and and Josh Heupels. They don't really have to worry about their quarterbacks too much. Um, and then you can kind of get the far end of that and say, you know, you have the, the quarterback killers. Um, so yeah. I, I think Jeff Scott kind of, when he first came to USF, it was definitely like, okay, this guy's worked with some really good quarterbacks some really good receivers in the past. That's a selling point for his first two seasons. But the further you get away from the Clemson years and the Clemson national championship and all that stuff, the less likely it's, it's that main selling point. I, I definitely think, and I, I, I've talked with many of the other coaches in the conference and around the league and Jeff Scott is still a reputable, you know, solid guy. People like Jeff Scott as a person, you know, there are times where he'll make a boneheaded call and, and a decision here and there, but he's the charismatic, lovable Southern draw guy straight from Arcadia, Florida, which is like 40 minutes South of us. You know, he, he's a good old Southern boy. He's the whole reason why my phone, I have an auto corrected from program to program. Because nice. his first, his press conference, it was 30 minutes. He said program like 50 times. And I'm like, all right, that's his, that's his sticking point for me now until, <laughs> until something different comes. But yeah, he, I mean, he definitely still has that Clemson light in him, but he is starting to, to get that USF bread and butter into him where he's saying, we got to sell what I have here, not what I did there, basically. Well, Steeg, obviously Gary Bohannon, his first year as a starter for Baylor, was very successful. So what, one of the things that I want to know is how USF fans and beat writers alike see the Gary Bohannon move and see Gary Bohannon as a quarterback. But first, I promise for everybody out there, Steeg's not going anywhere. I just have to tell you about Built Bar and the Built Bar Puffs. I will not shut up. I have been asked to shut up about it, and I will not shut up about it. Built Bar Puffs are insane. I told you about cake batter. I have told you about the cake 
the birthday cake built bar puffs right now. I am on a new favorite. I move quickly. I'm the guy that's in the car and the song gets like 45 seconds in. Once I heard the chorus once, I can change it. People hate that guy. I'm that guy most of the time. And I'm that guy right now with brownie batter puffs. I've already moved on to brownie batter puffs. They are like, the okay, I told you the cake stuff, right? Even less calories, 10 less calories, 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, 7 grams of sugar in the brown batter puffs. They are my pick to help facilitate. I'm going to Cape Cod this summer, so I have to build a summer bod. I don't have a summer bod right now. I've got to build it. I'm in the process of building it with the help of Built Bar Puffs, especially the brownie batter puffs. 100% real chocolate. It's like a candy bar, but not because candy bars have 250 calories. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off. Again, go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built Bar. Stieg, you're getting a 22,000 Yard 2,200 yard passer, 27 touchdowns last season combined. To imagine 22,000. That's like Joe Burrow stats. Uh, I was about to say, <laughs> right? That was that would be a lot. Uh, coming from Baylor University, that won a Sugar Bowl, played in a Big 12 that was, I'd say, much improved last season, aside from Texas. Ah, and a quarterback that was on the, the the top half of the league, especially early in the season. When you hear the name Gary Bohannon. What were some of those first things you thought when he first signed the dotted lines? And, and what are you still thinking now as you get to know him more? Well, I can tell you. So I, I do follow a bit of, of Baylor football throughout the year. Uh, two of my best friends from from high school went to Baylor. And so they, they've they always had that soft spot uh, in, in my heart. So and, and, you know, green and gold brother and have to stick together in this uh, cruel and, and uncharted world. But I, I followed a good bit of Baylor football last year because what I saw with uh, with Grimes and with uh, what Gary Bohannon were doing with uh, the offense was what I had been saying for the entire year that USF needs to, you know, get them on the phone and say, Hey, can we borrow a couple plays? Like, you know, that's, that's kind of the dynamic offense that you can really take advantage of, of the, the speed that's in the Tampa Bay area, the athletes that are on the roster and kind of veer away from it's still an RPO style of offense but you really put your best athletes on the field and give them the ball in their hands, whatever way possible. And so when I, I, I told my, uh, one of my uh, co-hosts that I work with, with the daily stampede, uh, Seth Barnador can attest to this. I said, during the season, I said, he, our offensive coordinator at the time, Charlie Weiss Jr. needs to call. Uh, is it Jeff Grimes? I cannot remember. Yeah. His yeah first Jeff, Grimes. Jeff Grimes and say, Hey, three pages. That's all I need. Just three pages from your playbook. I'll take it. And that's, that's how you can get the offense from being somewhat stagnant last year to a little bit more dynamic. And he went up to me, um, you know, unfortunately, Charlie West Jr. Took a job with Ole Miss. Don't see why he would have done that, of course, but you know, then you bring in a guy who knew the playbook, like the back of his hand and runs it pretty efficiently. And you bring in a new offense coordinator that runs a very similar style of offense from his previous stops. And you kind of have exactly what I was hoping for, but a lot better <laughs> because now you have the quarterback that was running that offense. Hmm. Looking at how Gary Bohannon fits into this program and, and really his full scope at Baylor, when you see those stats and understand the experience you get in the quarterback spot, how much more confidence does that give the USF nation going into next season rather than having a you know second year guy like God, rest in peace, Timmy McLean? <laughs> right. I, I think it kind of shows the fans, the coaches, and basically everyone else in the country that, you know, they're all in for next year. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that they would take a quarterback in, in this offseason. You know, they could easily throw Timmy out there, let Timmy kind of take his lumps where he does, make him get the experience, the end game stuff. I don't think they do that unless, and this is going to sound terrible, I don't think they can do that unless they know they can get to 500. And I know that sounds like a, you know, a, a backhanded compliment, but for how kind of downtrodden and how beat down this team was when Charlie Strong was fired back in 2018, or excuse me, back in 2019, like this, this team was devoid of, of talent with guys that are bought in with guys that want the program to build up. So it, it's, it's doesn't sound like a progress, but everyone's saying like, this is the year if we're going to be all in on Jeff Scott and we're going to be all in on, on this turnaround, 500 has to be the mark. It just so happens that we have one of the most difficult schedules in the country. And so it doesn't really play to the favor as much, but I, I think, I think fans know that this is, this is the all in move. This is, 
you got pocket aces, you, you really need a win here. This is how you're going to be able to do it. Stieg, pardon my reference here, but when I think 318, the dumpster fire of Charlie Strong leaving, and then you bring in Jeff Scott, and it's okay, you know, when does that trajectory happen? And it very well could be next year with, with Gary Bohan, and it feels like almost that you're throwing, comparatively, like a booby miles into the conversation with a team that's 3-18 and 18 over the last two years. So, granted, Gary, I mean, 2,200 yards, won the Sugar Bowl last season for a Big 12 team over Lane Kiffin and his new his new OC, soon to be. Uh, does it feel like you're adding in a really great diamond, but are there enough pieces to complement the rest of the necklace? I, I think so. Um, it, it's all going to come down to, to the meshing of a new offensive coordinator with a new quarterback, with a few new pieces here and there. But USF is still, they were busy in the transfer portal early but they still had some really good pieces to kind of build upon around that as well. You know, they weren't going for a full, you know, rebuild by any stretch of the imagination of, you know, having to get new receivers and running back. The running back room was, was very solid for USF last year. I, I would argue to say it was one of the it, top in the conference. You know, there was nothing to, to snuff at. They set a, a program rushing record against Temple with 421 rushing yards. And, and it was led by um, basically a running back by committee, but we called him the vulture, Jared Mango, because, he scored 16 touchdowns, rushing yeah. touchdowns last year, but none of them came further than nine yards out. So if you got us within the five yard, yeah, Jaron could get you that touchdown. But then you have other dynamic players that, that were on the USF team last year. Brian Batie comes to fruition where, you know, dynamic returner, but a shifty running back. And, and you know, you can get him some touches in space. Um, you bring back a few guys like Xavier Weaver, uh, I think he graded out as like top 15 in PFF last year for uh, for receivers. Graded out better than Drake London, who was drafted eighth overall to the Falcons. So you you have some solid pieces. And then an offensive line that's extremely, extremely experienced. Like that that four of the five had been together basically since their freshman year. Um, they brought in the JUCO offensive tackle two years ago to to put some pieces together. So now they, you have a really experienced offensive line, a really good running back room. You brought in three wide receivers who are, are just absolute blazers. So, you know, I think offensively, we weren't looking at the offense being the big issue last year. Frankly, from USF fans, it was the defense. Um, you know, defense coordinator is, is long gone now, and he got fired before the season ended. And that was the main gripe from last year. But I think offensively, Gary's going to have some weapons that can, He'll 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 enjoy the Florida speed down here. He's got to get used to the heat a little bit, but I think he's got some good uh, playmakers for his disposal. Stieg, I love the idea of looking at USF schedule next season and kind of giving a ceiling for Gary Bohannon. But the, the last question I have on on the point of him being at UCF and what he brings to the team: Does this feel like kind of a dream scenario for USF in what they could have gotten from a quarterback standpoint out of the transfer portal? I, I think absolutely. Um, I, I spent a lot of hours working with someone to figure out what's going on in the transfer portal. Um, and there were some good options for USF, but for me, at least it, it came down to, as I said earlier, bring in a guy that's been around for three to four years, maybe got a grad transfer. Um, USF has a fantastic graduate program uh, for any Baylor fans out there. And you want to enjoy the weather as well. Uh, USF has one of the top graduate programs in the country. So you could kind of, you know, sell it to a guy that's been a backup for a little bit, maybe had a bit of playing time and say, hey, if you come here on scholarship, you know, Vinick Sports Management Group is a, is a fantastic uh, addition to our MUMA College of Business in two years. And that's all you really need. And you're, you're kind of set. So I, I thought they would just get a guy on a flyer, basically just a guy looking for an education. But instead, you go out there and get one of the best quarterbacks in the Big 12. I, I don't think I could ask for anything better at that point. Well, Stieg, the the next area I, I want to go to is kind of looking up and down USF schedule next season. And, and I mentioned, you know, we talked about it on on the show two weeks ago, which I just I feel like this entire today is just to erase that. Uh, and, <laughs> it's and your redemption I'm, arc. Appease the angry USF fans that hopefully we're getting close to to redemption for. Uh, but you know, I kind of mentioned the, the one that I circled was the game at Temple, where it's the dichotomy of one year you're playing Oklahoma at home and you're torching them to win. The next year you're playing at Temple on November 5th in the snow in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But what I failed to look at, this is me apologizing, 
What I failed to look at was BYU, Florida, Louisville on the road, Cincinnati on the road, Houston on the road, SMU, UCF, a full list of teams on the schedule that are really, really solid opportunities for Gary to shine against competition that's revered across the country. Looking at the schedule up and down, when you mentioned USF needing to go 500 or better and a great progression that would be under Jeff Scott, how do they do it with a schedule like this? Ooh, it's it's gonna it's gonna be tough. I'll tell you that. Um, you know, it, it starts game one. Um, a, a great chance at redemption for USF. Um, the series against BYU that was scheduled like six years ago is turning out to be one of the more important uh, series that USF could ever ask for. Uh, three years ago, when they came down to Tampa, um, USF ended up pulling a, a monumental upset out of out of their ass. And then last year, uh, traveling to BYU, starting Timmy McLean as a true freshman on the road in one of the most hostile environments. And he didn't play terribly by any stretch of the imagination. Actually, he played phenomenally. He led a 96 yard, or nine, excuse me, 94 yard touch uh, to bring the game within uh, one, a uh, one score game late in the fourth. Um, again, the only issue was we didn't have a defense that could, you know, stop a nosebleed at that point. But yeah. it, it would be a, a monumental, you know, message back to the rest of the conference and, and frankly, the rest of the country, because everyone kind of says the same thing about USF. They were number two in the country in 2007. Everyone hears about it all the time. They beat West Virginia at home. It was electric. It was wonderful. And then you don't really hear about the rest of the story about what happened with USF. You just kind of know that one thing. And and so I think it's one of those things that can put USF back on the map and, and start that rebuilding process of, hey, we're not just UCF's rival to the to the Southeast. We're our own competitive program. Um, so I think it, it starts in that game. You know, you, you hope for an upset. You hope for a win. BYU is also returning a lot of their talent from last year. That was a very solid program. They added, you know, a few athletic pieces as well. So, you know, you're, you're starting out tough. You, you get them at home. It's going to be a noon kickoff uh, in the late August, early September time frame, which is the best case scenario that you could ask for for a team traveling from the West Coast is you, you get them sleepwalking at, at noon and at 98 degrees and, and hope that your athletes are, are, aren't going to get as cramped up. But yeah. you're right. I mean, the rest of the schedule does get just as tough. You know, you travel to Florida. You travel to Louisville. You you play four of the new Big Twelve schools in the yeah. same calendar year. So you know you're they they now have those recruits that are wanting to play in the Big Twelve. So you have that upper level of talent. SMU is is no slouch by any stretch of the imagination either. So really, it you know we're saying hey, five hundred is is the record that we need to get to. But by God, it's a difficult mark to get to. Stieg, with that, what is the ceiling for one Gary Bohannon? I know that there are probably a lot of listeners on today's show that are like, this is weird. Locked on Baylor. This is a lot of USF talk. And it (laughs) is. And the reason why is because I think Baylor Nation has this soft spot for Gary Bohannon. I'll get on my soapbox for a second. The guy was, you know, the first one at the facility every single day, the last one to leave, one of the best in the weight room. He was a team captain who just... Every single day, just gave it all. Super humble kid. I remember asking him in a press conference after his first start, you know, Gary, you came from Earl, Arkansas to Baylor, and now you're playing in front of sold-out crowds at McLean Stadium, playing against top 10 opponents and beating them. What is the dichotomy in that? I mean, is there a shock that comes between going from 2A Arkansas high school football to this? And he was like, man, I just kind of play football. Like, dang, it takes some gumption to get up there and be like, I don't know, who cares? I'm just here to play football. He's just that guy, right? Was always, and he's so beloved by Baylor fans. So obviously we, we want the world for him. And I know Dave Aranda does too. That's why he made this decision to give Gary the opportunity to transfer. So what is his ceiling with USF next season? Right. And, and trust us, we're going to do the best we can to take care of him because I, I know how beloved he was. And, you know, when, when the rumor starts swirling, I, I, I go through Twitter and I try to find videos and everything, but, it, there was it, just so much sentiment towards Gary Bohannon and what he did to turn around Baylor in that one year. It, it's 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 heart wrenching to be like, yeah, we're going to take him and hopefully he's going to do the same thing for us here. Uh, but I mean, the ceiling for us is it, it's again, it sounds bad, but the ceiling that we kind of want to get back into is he doesn't need to throw 42 touchdown passes or any stretch of the imagination. I mean, Timmy McLean, God bless him. 
he did fantastic last year. He threw five touchdown passes. Yeah. You know, we, we need a little bit more gumbo out of it. We need, we need to kind of get a little bit more of that deep passing threat back. You know, for me, at least I, if he gets 14 touchdown passes, adds five or six on the ground, limits the interceptions and is just an efficient pocket passer, you know, that that's, that's what we can look for. And that's what we're going to kind of look at. You know, the ceiling, and I, I joked about it, but the the ceiling really for USF, if you can absolutely hit on every single one of these transfers that came in this year, fix this defense that is atrocious to just bad, you know, this team can win probably seven to eight games, pull an upset here and there. They need to do something, but really, we don't need Gary to be the world beater. I, I, I joke about this, but we don't need him to go out there and beat Oklahoma every single week. Yeah. We just need him to not lose to UCF at the end of the season. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll all be square. We'll shake hands at the end of the day and say it was a successful, uh, you know, loan over to us at that point. Stieg, uh, last question here for you. There was one USF fan, very obviously emotionally charged, so I don't hold it against them, but they, they had sent a tweet in response that was along the lines of, you know, just a, a tired Big 12 team and a failing Big 12, you know, in Baylor that, that's upset about losing a guy. And obviously the, the realm of college football is changing. These conferences are, are much different in Baylor, the Big 12. They're losing a lot of revenue with Oklahoma and Texas leaving. That can't be argued. For USF then, it must become crucial to stay afloat in a college football realm that is burying teams that aren't already power five. How important is this next season individually for USF to stay afloat in college football, or is it not going to matter how well or how bad they do? They are going to be where they are going to end up. It's it, it, you, you ask me on a certain day of the week and, and you'll get a different answer every single time. I'll, 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 I'll be frank with it that way. I think, um, you know, the, our, our coaches from all of our sports, uh, this coaches prayer van tour, and I promise I'll try to keep this short, but they, uh, they went around to all the different cities in, in the area, Tampa to Miami to Orlando, and meeting up with alumni and, and doing fan recruiting is what they called it. You know, a lot of these guys were hired during COVID. This was kind of their first chance to get back face to face. And, you know, I, I, they realize how crucial this next calendar year is going to be when it comes to the landscape of not just college football, but college athletics as a whole. You yeah. know, the, the NIL deals that are going on and, you know, the, the transfer portal being as lenient as it is, you know, it, we're coming very close to the great divide. Where that divide is going to happen, where that line is, you know, some days I think it's like 70 to 80 teams are going to end up on one side and the other half are going to end up on the other. And then there are some days like today where I'm like, yeah, it might just be like 25 teams that have, and then everyone else is just like one B at that point. So for USF, at least they're, they're doing all the right things off the playing surfaces to put themselves in a position of, of attraction towards a big 12, an ACC, a big 10, something along those lines. Um, you know, they, they broke ground on an in indoor practice facility that, that cost you know, close to $27 million. It's, I kid you not, going to be the nicest one in the state of Florida going up against Florida, Florida State, Miami, and UCF. Then, you know, USF has been uh, renting out through Ray J for the last couple of years as well. You know, they're finally putting the plans together and they have a, uh, a meeting in a, about three weeks here. Uh, in front of the board of trustees for USF to propose the plan. And it, it sounds like it's all going to be, you know, full steam ahead for an on-campus football stadium, mm -hmm. you know, cost, whatever it's going to be is what it's going to be. But, you know, they've realized and they're doing the investments off the fields right now, hiring uh, different, you know, support positions to give help to our coaches and our athletic directors and all that stuff. They're doing everything they can off the court. They just have to win on the field and I, I i promise you and i'll say it on the record here you usf will either find their way on the right side of history or that crack is going to be just the sec and everyone else is just going to be fine but usf is doing everything they possibly can at this point because damn it the worst shot in the heart that you could ever ask for was your rival uh getting basically you getting passed over and your rival was you know scooped up to to the big 12. i don't think the big 12 is dying but i also don't think that the Big 12 is going to be the Big 12 for as much longer. I think there's going to be an, uh, a lot of changes.
throughout all the different conferences at this point. I mean, it's it's only a matter of time before the SEC kicks out Vanderbilt at this point, if, for all yeah. I'm looking at. <laughs> now, Stig, we'll see definitely how it pans out. And in the end, we can lay our heads to rest at night knowing that only two quarterbacks will start next season, their football seasons, at Raymond James Stadium, one being Tom Brady and one being Gary Bohannon. That much yes. is true. And uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, if there are any Baylor fans out there that have a USF bone in their body, where can they find you? Uh, it's I, I realize now I put my Twitter handle in improperly there. You, you added that at there too. But it's at Robert Stieglife. Um, I, I'm very active on Twitter for, for three things, uh, for food, uh, for Survivor, and for USF Athletics. So if you guys have any questions about just the group of five landscape or what's going on down here, you just want to relive the glory days of what the hell was happening in 2007. You can find me there. Um, you can also find me at our, uh, we do a live podcast with the daily stampede. Um, it is at stampede SBN. It is on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube as well. Uh, we pop in those every once in a while, uh, during the off season, but during football season, uh, we definitely do it once a week just to, you know, get things going. So, and, and this this is an absolutely wonderful. And I, again, I apologize for bringing the wrath of USF fans onto you for a little bit there, but I'm glad you were open and willing to uh, to having this open discussion and uh, to talk. Uh, we'll we'll take care of Gary the best we can. I promise you that. This is a place to learn and grow and admit when we're, when we're wrong, and we're doing that today. And thanks again, Steve, for coming on. I want to thank you all out there for making Locked On Baylor your first listen every single day. Make your second lesson Locked On NBA Big Board. Rafael Burlo, Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, those guys have big boards across the NBA draft. Talking to Jeremy Sohan, where's that guy going to go? No longer Matthew Myers. He is pulled out of the NBA draft, but also Kendall Brown, those dudes as well. Uh, if Steve, Matthew Mayer is looking for a school to go to, by the way, um, when this show we, airs, we'll who knows? <laughs> who knows? That everything's changing. We will see what happens. I'll put a word in. I'll put a bug in his ear. But uh, thank you folks again for making us the first listen every day. Come back tomorrow because we're going to have the director of recruiting on our show, John Garcia Jr. from Sports Illustrated, talking Baylor recruiting. This has been, always will be, Locked on Baylor.